people are already in, in the cemetery, and then the shooting starts. For the vast majority of the people that got killed ran this way. Yes. Directly into the, yeah. the bullets. The vast majority of the people that survived is that who ran that ran way. That way. And you were one of them that managed to escape through the cemetery. At the back side, yeah. Is it still crystal in your head? Yes, very, really? very much, very much. But actually, it was, uh, you know, Steve was brave enough to say enough is enough. And then we had to fight until independence or, or death. Liberty or death? Yeah. I'm Ian Grant, and I've spent the last three decades using my background in history and art history, exploring cultures all around the world. In this series, I'll take you to places I've never been to before. Experiencing local life through the lens of the world's artists, artisans, and keepers of culture. This is Culture Quest. Gustavus Adolphus College equips students to lead purposeful lives and act on the great challenges of our time. Gustavus, make your life count. Over a billion people live with preventable blindness. See International partners with volunteer doctors to provide sight-restoring surgeries in underserved communities around the world. This organization is united in one mission, to restore sight to the blind. They purify the air I breathe and the water I drink, keep me and the planet cool, and give me a career I love. Trees, when we take care of them, they take care of us. We all seek different in our own ways because different reflects who you are, who you want to be. The Northern Territory, different in every sense. East Timor takes up mainly the northern half of Timor Island, just north of Australia. It's the youngest country in this part of the world, declaring independence in 1999 after a brutal 24-year-long fight with Indonesia. A struggle that saw as many as 200,000 East Timorese losing their lives as casualties of war, group executions from starvation. And while there is, of course, no way for us to encompass even a fraction of what happened here, there is a great place to start at an old prison turned war memorial museum in the capital city of Dili. This episode has some hard moments in it, but in order to talk about the present, you have to try and understand the past. So for the first half of this episode, a little history. Good. Hugo. Hey, hey, Ian. Hugo Fernandez is the executive director of Centro Nacional Chega, or just called Chega, a prison during Portuguese colonial times, and then taken over by the Indonesians and used to house mainly political prisoners all through the war. Now the prison has been turned into a museum that describes through displays as well as the original prison itself all that East Timor went through over the 24-year fight for independence. Basically this section is telling about the, the whole context of self-determination gotcha. and then the most significant dates in Timor history about hap what happened uh, during 1960 to 1999. All of these dates, all of these photos and moments in time reflect a very real part of the struggle. They're an indicator of people losing their freedom, their liberty, their lives. And ultimately, conquering insurmountable odds. A tiny country on a tiny island in the Coral Triangle going up against a major and at the time aggressive world power. And eventually, in 1999, winning. One of the most important events on this timeline was the Santa Cruz Massacre of November 12, 1991. That's one of the, the turning points of Timor history. It kind of difficult to convince international community about the atrocities happening yeah. here because there is no proof. A reporter managed to film the massacre when Indonesian soldiers opened fire on a group of mainly student protesters at the Santa Cruz Cemetery 
killing scores of them. It's that moment in time that we'll focus on later in the episode. Throughout the museum, you see posters like this one describing the individual horror that so many people went through here. We hid in a friend's house from where we heard the screams of people being killed. I mean, you see it everywhere. We were put in crates like chickens. Uh, Is that a well? It's a well, and then after they kill people, then they just dump it down. The museum is also a repository for all of the evidence that was collected for a 2,500-page Truth and Reconciliation report. And Hugo was the team research leader and co-editor of it. People testimonies, we recorded Indonesian military operations documents. Oh, that's what all this is? Uh, research, more than about uh, 25,000 archive. That report was used in part as a guideline for reconciliation with Indonesia and reconstruction in East Timor. Next, we move into the area where the high-level political prisoners were held and tortured. So this is the, the dark cells. All of the cells in this part of the prison were called dark cells, with any vestiges of light completely blocked out. Previously, it's all totally... This one they call the submarine cell. It's a sleep deprivation cell. So all human waste, water, everything is put into out here. So it's a you to sit and sleep. What? Yeah. So if you sleep, you sit and you're going to be drawn. You're going to drown in, and drown into in people's, people's waste, waste and filth. And filth and everything. So you have to stand. You have to stand up. This is it's a really dark one. Prisoners would be placed in here for days, weeks, or even months, left in complete darkness, occasionally being taken out to be tortured for information and then put back in. In one time, has, in that cell particularly, yeah. they have more than 32. And immediately in the first night, two of them would die. So it's they really, couldn't even sit down. They couldn't even sit down. And they the just people that died? Died because of... Uh, 32 people, 32 in, here. people in here. So this is, we start oh. to register some of the political prisoners who was in, was jailed here from 1975. Right when it all started, yeah. yeah. They were registered, continue to register whose name is not here. Oh, okay. so these are people that come in people and... People come in and write their name that I was here and then provide some information. For me, it's a responsibility, actually. Yeah. We have a huge, actually, gap uh, in, uh, in our generation. We have, uh, but also we are lucky enough because we have all generations still alive. My self seen working here is how to link that old generation with the young generation. A major part of the museum's outreach is towards students, from school tours and guest lecturers to university students holding weekly classes here. The history that, that carried by the old generation to transfer it to the young generation. Yeah. So that's, that's basically what is motivated. This is Naldo Rey with a master's degree in international communications. He's worked for the United Nations as head of sustainable development here. He's been a consultant for Oxfam, was the lead researcher for a United Nations report on East Timor's progress since independence. And he is a published author, including a book he is best known for called Resistance, A Childhood Fighting for East Timor. It's a personal account of his life in the East Timor resistance until he was in his mid-twenties and independence came to the country. In his teens, he was a courier for the top clandestine leader, Sabalai, during the war. In 1984, when Nalda was nine, his family lived in the jungle, and his father, a leader in the resistance, was captured, and along with five others, was executed somewhere on a jungle path, without Naldo and his family knowing his father's fate. When Naldo couldn't find answers, he wanted to join the resistance. On his way back from meeting with the rebels, he was captured by the Indonesian army. And then when they capture me, they, you know, even appeal to the community that don't follow this, this boy's uh, steps. Because they really? try to... Uh, to use you as an example? Yeah, as an example. If you, if you do or do anything like him, we will torture you like, like him. They so, tortured you when you were yes, nine? Yes, yes, We were at uh, Shega 
So you were actually in that prison at one point? Yes, yes. I was spent 59 days. In the dark room? Dark room. Naldo was 17 years old at the time. The, but the worst is that, you know, when you enter the prison, they took all your clothes. So they throw you in there naked? Yeah, naked. That toilet is already full. Full and in everywhere, you know. Oh, on the floor, on the floor and everything. everywhere, everything. So they stick you in there yes, naked? A naked in, body and you sleep on an actual human base. So there's no legal proceedings, right? They can just pull you they off the street. They can put you on the street and they kill you or they put you in prison for any days, any months, any years. It's up to them. When they release me, I talk to the, the another courier so I can meet the clandestine leaders immediately. And were you in school during all this too? Yeah, I go to study there as a student and work in the nighttime as a courier, clandestine courier. So you're... So, so your life right then was you were in, in prison, you come out, you're reporting to the Indonesian army in the morning, you're going to school to study, and then you're doing clandestine work in the evening. Yes. But I, I also, you know, study very hard because I got message from the guerrilla fighter. One day Timor become an independence. Mm -hmm. If you don't study, yeah. you're going to leave this country. Were you still in school when the Santa Cruz Yes. Oh, you were? Okay. Yes, yes. How old were you when that happened? Whew. I think I was 16, 16 or 17. I think we should maybe head over there if, if, you're, if you're up for it. Definitely. Uh, and tell more of your incredible story, man. Yeah. Definitely. Okay, let's do let's it. Let's go. The Santa Cruz massacre all started from a march in protest over the killing of independence supporter Sebastião Gomez. Rarely allowed in the country by the Indonesian government, reporters were also in town at the time of Gomez's memorial service at the Motile Church. So the clandestine movement organized a big march from the church to the Santa Cruz Cemetery to give reporters a glimpse into what was happening in East Timor. As part of the clandestine group, Naldo circulated recorded messages from independence leader Zanana Guzmao urging people to join the march. It ended up being the largest protest since occupation began, made up of mainly students and young people. When we come here, is we start protesting, and then you know the young generation, uh, young, young young the students, they already put you know banners and uh, on the top of that that yeah. uh, the entry. Yeah. And the Indonesia is still already around us that uh, stop you know protesting. But people keep yelling, uh, Viva yeah. Timor Leste, and uh, Indonesia out now. Yeah. And, uh, so suddenly they start shooting. There were several journalists at the massacre, one of whom was killed, two more severely beaten. But somehow the journalist Max Stahl managed to keep filming after the violence broke out. Well, lucky that he uh, somehow he saved the, the, the tape. Max's footage eventually gets smuggled out of East Timor and makes its way back to England, where it's aired on television there and gets picked up by major networks and is seen all around the world, including in Indonesia, at long last drawing the world's attention. They bombarding, you know, from the sea, from, from the land and yeah. from the air. And the people is flee to the jungle and then die from the hunger. Nobody pay attention. Nobody pays Nobody attention. Pay attention. The turning point was uh, on 12 November mm -hmm. 1991, the massacre, where the world opened their eyes what happened, you know, really happened in the Timor. As for Naldo, this isn't even the midway point of his story of resistance. At every turn, he would have another incredible anecdote of his times during the struggles. And he's quick to say that he was just one of thousands of people with equally incredible stories, all of which collectively came together to create an independent East Timor. Sometimes people talk about um, more mourning all the time. So we should also think about the future. 
So how we can um, value their sacrifice in the world? That's what they want, the country in a better uh, shape, in, uh, independent as a nation, as a country, as a people. Have self-determination. Self-determination, yes. Yeah. yeah. On that note, we make a sharp turn to the future of East Timor. Now over two decades since independence, and life here seems quite normal. People going about their daily lives, after work soccer games, bustling local markets, families and friends fishing at low tide. It looks like what you would expect from any busy city on an island nation. There is no denying that this country has had its fair share of struggles since independence in 1999. But in the grand scheme of things, it's still a young country. And people here seem determined and hopeful. And there are a lot of things for the country to pin its hopes on. Small and large scale fishing, strong agriculture of all variety, large oil and gas reserves, and a huge opportunity for all variety of tourism. With a huge generation gap from the war, much of the hopes for the future of East Timor falls on the shoulders of the younger generation, and many of them have an eye towards progressive change. This is Anasia Teme, and she has a degree in marine biology and has already amassed quite a resume working in conservation with an emphasis in marine biology and preservation. She's also one of the original members of the group Buiberi Nirishka, a women's art collective. Yeah. So the group is just like recently created, and it was nine women. They won a commission to paint a mural on a giant wall in one of the busiest sections of town. Okay. So we give like training two days, two full days before the painting, Yeah. so that we can understand better painting. And then we started working there, like painting for 14 days. The project was created to give the artists a way to encourage people and empower women to collectively change social norms about violence against women. The women in the collective decided to focus imagery on solutions and aspirations. In a country that's trying to work its way towards gender equality, it's an especially big deal for young women and girls to be able to walk by a mural like this and see such positive images that they themselves could aspire to. This mural is like also represents like to um, represent their self mm -hmm. and that represents their hobby. It's like this, this one, like because she loves painting, she loves music. This one is about the LGBTI because um, here is still like most people they, they still don't accept it. This one is about this after like mother usually they give birth, they are like shy to show off their scares. Scars. Yeah, like a like a C section or yes. something. And this means like hell dreams and yeah. go high as well. Oh the sore. Yeah. This one means like women cannot walk at night because like they will uh, men will attack. And is she Crossing out the can't. Yeah. So now woman can. Well, really. Brilliant. For me, it's like to express myself uh, and represent women as, as a whole in Timor. They can uh, understand our feelings, our expressions yeah. through the paintings. Women's rights in, in East Timor have a little ways to go, right? It's, yes, it, but yeah. is it moving in that direction? Yeah, it's like at the moment, like nowadays, it's moving. People already understand. So it should give support as well to women. So, so we try to like make um, establish establish the same payment or same treatment. Women are in sports so, uh, more and more here. Yes. Yeah. In the past, it was unusual. Yeah. Like for women to become more active, like nowadays. soccer player yes. or anything. But now, yeah. now it's much more. Like some women more focus on um, how to say youth use activities, especially for um, promoting peace, promoting uh, equality as well. This is you? Yes. Yeah. This is the sentence, it's like, women also can, but instead, women can't. Like, if it's like, it doesn't cross out, it's like, women also can. Oh, women also but can. But if like, it cross out, it's like, women can. It's like, give spirit slam. Yes. It's 
early morning. We're about to head over to uh, Ataurua Island. And I don't know if the camera will pick it up, but you can kind of see the outline of the island. It's a, maybe an hour and a half uh, as the crow flies straight across the ocean. Nice calm seas. We're going straight to uh, go spear fishing and free diving with these women that go out and catch fish for the village. Ataruro Island is just a little over 15 miles off the coast, and the communities that have lived there for centuries now survive in large part from what the ocean provides. And this is an amazing bit of ocean. It drops to over two miles deep between Dili and Ataruro, and is an important feeding and migration route for any variety of sea creature you can think of. We get uh, 23 different species of dolphin and whale that either pass through here or are resident here permanently. Blue whales and sperm whales. Huge dolphin pods that will happily surf the bow wave of your boat. This little area in the Coral Triangle recently caught Conservation International's eye. Um, they did a survey on the um, east coast of Atauro on a reef there. And they said there is very few places in the world that have as high a biodiversity as that reef there. We get in between the straight super pods of a thousand plus dolphins passing through, killer whales, pygmy killer whales, tons of different things. If you're a diver, this place should be high on your list. After starting to see dwindling fish populations, the communities on Ataruro recently collaborated with conservation groups to create protected marine areas and no fishing zones all around the island in hopes of increasing fish stocks. Dive companies agreed to pay a fee to dive here, and some of that money goes directly to the island's communities. As a result of this collaboration, people are starting to catch more and larger fish. Dive groups are seeing incredible marine life. Traditional fishing villages are starting to see a second source of income through sustainable tourism, and large sections of reef all around the island are protected and thriving. But this is why we're here, to visit the village of Adara and its spear-fishing women. And it's so stunning here. All we really had to do was turn our cameras on, slip into the water, and press record. The women, known in the region as Wawata Topu, which translates to women divers, have made a name for themselves in an occupation that has for centuries traditionally been the domain of men, and they use whatever gear they can come up with to do it. Handmade wooden goggles, taped together scuba masks, simple sharpened metal rods as spears, doing it all in their flip-flops and sarongs whatever it takes to get the job done. The men here go out on boats to fish every day, but sometimes the catch just isn't enough to make ends meet. So the women fell back onto what they had done since childhood, swimming and diving for fish. They mainly sell what they catch, clam, octopus, fish, and sell it at a market on the other side of the island, which is either a long boat ride or a two-hour trek over the island, because there are no roads in or out of Adara. The extra money they earn is used to buy additional supplies for the village, as well as helping to send their kids to school. The women here didn't set out to make social change. They just wanted to put some extra food on their table. But that simple act of them going out into the ocean and fishing is changing the way people on the island perceive gender roles. And that speaks volumes for what's going on in this village. One of the more striking things, in addition to the underwater landscape, was the non-stop laughter. 
not only from the fisherwomen, but also from the rest of the village hanging out watching what's going on. Even this woman, trying to keep a serious face for the cameras, started to laugh. And while they have their fair share of struggles living on the remote side of a remote island like this one, they were so welcoming, so genuine, so willing to share in their culture. We filmed here for the better part of a morning and an afternoon, but could have stayed here for days. So here, we're, we're just, uh, what, a couple miles out of Dili, and it feels like a completely different place, right? Yes. White sand beaches, it's Sunday, so everyone's out playing, which has actually got to be, after all that this country's been through, just to see kids playing in the water and having a good time and doing what kids should be doing. This is what we fought for. We want to see the, the people to be happy, enjoy their life, and those people who sacrifice themselves, die for this country, want to see them to be happy. To be a country that the base of the needs of the people itself. Mm -hmm. Not we just copy from another country and the paste here. Yeah, yeah, cut and paste. Cut yeah. and paste. Yeah. But we want to the country that are originated by the East Timorese, and identity of the East Timorese, the culture of East Timorese, yeah. that can build a unique right. uh, culture and a unique uh, country in the world. You know, we become an independent country, nobody believe it. A small country and a war against the biggest country, giant country, but we won. We won our freedom. We proud to be as East Timorese. Yeah. We're proud to be uh, called Maubere people. So this is the, our identity. To be the country to be more um, as a proud country as a steam race. <laughs> Gustavus Adolphus College equips students to lead purposeful lives and act on the great challenges of our time. Gustavus, make your life count. Over a billion people live with preventable blindness. See International partners with volunteer doctors to provide sight-restoring surgeries in underserved communities around the world. This organization is united in one mission, to restore sight to the blind. They purify the air I breathe and the water I drink, keep me and the planet cool, and give me a career I love. Trees, when we take care of them, they take care of us. We all seek different in our own ways because different reflects who you are, who you want to be. The Northern Territory, different in every sense.